I'm Reinhardt with a T. Um, it's an honor to be here, and I was asked to speak about uh, international financial crises. And they selected me probably for the last session because I'm known to be loud, so I think it's in the hope of keeping people awake uh, this, this late in the day. Um, before launching into the topic of international financial crises, I'd like to just say a couple of words about my strategy towards uh, studying uh, financial crises over the past couple of decades or so. Um, my approach to understanding crises uh, has been uh, empirical, as uh, Ken highlighted in his presentation. Uh, the view uh, is a long view. Uh, my work with Kaminsky spanned decades. My work with Ken, it's uh, more a couple of centuries. Uh, but importantly, it's about putting also the crises in a broader historical perspective and international perspective. Uh, it's international in scope, so I am going to talk about crises in emerging markets. I'm going to make references to different regions. Um, because it's international in scope, it also allows for different interesting aggregation strategies. And I'd like to call the approach also two-track in the sense that over and beyond talking about more aggregative cross-sectional analysis or panel, uh, it's important to, where possible, this is not always possible, but where possible, know the first and last name of the crisis episode in terms of uh, having country chronologies, having uh, uh, important country history. A big focus of both my work with Graciela Kaminsky and my work with Ken Rogoff has been on the interconnectedness of crises. And if you go back, there is a very rich literature on banking crises, but uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, Kaminsky and I began to highlight that uh, uh, there is a systematic relationship between uh, banking and currency crises. And I will talk about that interconnectedness uh, today. The body of the work is a theoretical in the sense that it's not imposing a particular model uh, on the data, but to look for recurring patterns. It's importantly informed uh, by theory in terms of uh, what variables to select and what to expect before, during, and after uh, a financial crisis. This is, uh, I mentioned my work with uh, Ken Rogoff is global in scope. Uh, the green represents the sample. It accounts for about 95% of uh, world GDP. I am going to focus on uh, the market economy or boom-bust variety of uh, financial crises. And that comes from a very rich literature. Uh, uh, some of those works are cited here. And of course, uh, this um, um, PowerPoint uh, will be uh, available. Um, I'm going to start where with the drivers of the boom, and we've already had a discussion today on this, uh, what drives the initial boom in credit, the initial uh, drivers uh, of leverage. And in that context, of course, there's been you know classic work, Friedman and Schwartz, Kindleberger, focusing on the role of domestic monetary policy ample liquidity in being a driver of the credit boom that typically precedes a uh, severe financial crisis. I'm going to focus primarily on the liberalization, which has been talked about. Uh, and liberalization does many of the same things as uh, monetary policy in that it can facilitate, financial liberalization can facilitate uh, lending, it can also bring credit access to a much broader swath uh, of the population. Importantly, because of uh, 
the open economy nature of, 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 of the work, uh, there's also capital account liberalization plays a role. Namely, you can also feed a domestic credit boom by borrowing from abroad. And capital inflows uh, have played an important role in feeding many of the uh, credit booms that have been discussed throughout today. In my work with Guillermo Calvo, Leo Lederman, and, and uh, the early 1990s, uh, we argued that international interest rates, international commodity prices, international factors in general, were big drivers uh, of those booms. So, turning to the connection between financial liberalization and banking crises. Um, Kaminsky and I uh, documented that on the basis of uh, individual country chronologies and so on, the, a, a, a banking crisis typically came following financial liberalization. Indeed, financial liberalization helped you predict uh, uh, future banking crises. Furthermore, that the incidence of banking crises proliferated uh, post-liberalization. In my work with Ken Rogoff, uh, this is bigger than, the core, our, than our core sample, looking at 125 countries and more than 300 uh, banking crisis episodes. This also includes the less systemic, more borderline cases. Uh, we conclude that there is a very tight connection across history between uh, capital market integration, i.e. Uh, having an open capital account, and uh, the incidence of uh, banking crises. And this is shown here with uh, the Obstfeld-Taylor uh, index of uh, capital mobility, but in more recent work with Reinhardt and Trebisch using a different index based on bond issuance and so on, uh, you get a very similar pattern. Uh, of note is, as been discussed earlier, in the era of heavy regulation uh, and a lot of capital controls, there is uh, a relative dearth of uh, financial crises. It's also of note that the big uh, synchronous crisis episodes, a la 2007-2009, a la 1930s, is absent uh, during this uh, era. Let me turn to the issue now of the links between banking, currency, and debt crises. First, on the connection between uh, banking and currency. Uh, this paper with uh, Graciela Kaminsky was written in uh, 1996 in between the Mexican crisis and the Asian crisis. It was ultimately published in 99. And there, what we saw again is that there were these strands in the literature uh, on looking at currency crises and looking at banking crises, but looking at them in isolation. And the, an interesting pattern emerged uh, from, from this work that uh, there seemed to be evidence of a vicious circle where the beginning of a banking crisis often uh, leads to future currency problems, often because central banks act as a lender of last resorts and provide a lot of liquidity, which in turn can soften the currency if not outright uh, uh, lead to a currency crash, uh, and that the, 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 the currency crash in turn makes the banking problem worse, often because uh, there are currency mismatches, but also more generally uh, the um, uh, the, the, the issue that, that you may have adverse uh, balance sheet effects and that interest rate defenses may also be harmful to the banking sector. Um, in my work with Ken Rogoff, uh, we turned our attention to the nexus between uh, banking crises and sovereign debt crises. Uh, in his presentation, Ken mentioned that one of the legacies of systemic banking crises is that the government ends up with a lot of debt. Uh, 
and it ends up on a lot of debt because often it takes over a lot of what was formerly uh, private debt, uh, and also because of the long and severe recessions that often follow systemic crises. So in this work, true to that two-track approach, we did uh, uh, cross-country analysis, we did panel, we also looked at individual histories. I will show an example of that. But the bottom line, uh, the takeaway from that study is that banking crises tend to increase the probability of a sovereign debt crisis, not the other way around. We're not saying doom loops do not exist anywhere. That is not the point, but the, this is the pattern that emerges more frequently. And uh, this is supported, this kind of, of causality uh, it is supported by uh, the individual uh, country episodes and country histories. This is a 200-year illustration here for Brazil. So here is uh, the panorama that I'm going to talk about in the remaining time that I'm going to walk through or more accurately gallop through uh, in the remainder of my presentation. And it's basically a sequence. This is not etched in stone, but it is a prototype of what emerges uh, from the uh, recurring patterns that starts out with financial liberalization or financial innovation. Uh, you have the uh, boom in economic activity, asset prices, credit, uh, capital flows, the onset of the slowdown, uh, the banking problems, and in the worst case, uh, the ultimate uh, um, process could end in a sovereign uh, debt crisis. So a priori, one would expect that if you have a composite problem, if you have a banking problem, if you have a currency crash, and if you have a sovereign debt problem, that that crisis might be more severe. Uh, and so one of the things that has been discussed is the uh, fact that from multiple sources, my, my, my work with uh, Ken Rogoff uh, uh, documented uh, this issue, as have uh, uh, other uh, studies, is that the uh, post-crisis uh, recessions are not your run-of-the-mill business cycle varieties. And in part, in part, there are other reasons which I will hopefully discuss, but in part this involves the fact that if you look at the worst 100 crises, this, these are taken from my work with uh, Rogoff in 2009 and more recent work in 2014, uh, of the 100 worst systemic crises for which we have full data since the mid-19th century, a third of those also involved a debt crisis and a currency crisis, so it's a triple whammy. And uh, more than half of them uh, were twin crises a la kaminsky reinhardt So how do we gauge severity? There are many ways of measuring the severity uh, of, of, a, uh, of, a, of a banking crisis or a, or a crisis in general. But one plausible approach, this is what uh, Ken Rogoff and I uh, have used is to look at per capita GDP, look at the severity of the recession, and then count the number of years it takes you to get back to your pre-crisis peak. So it's a very straightforward, uh, and fo the focus on per capita income is important because we're comparing crises that are across different times and also across different countries in which population growth is very different uh, across these episodes. So here is sort of the, the hall of shame. Uh, these are the most severe of the 100 here are ranked from the most severe to less severe uh, of those 100 crises. These are the worst 25. And uh, what you see is a lot of orange. A lo the orange are the tri triple crises. Uh, the green are the currency and banking crisis. And the white are the pure uh, banking crisis, which I hope uh, stimulates people in this room to when they're thinking about modeling uh, 
uh, crises to, to certainly think about that open economy uh, aspect to these. Now, on the antecedents, what I'm going to do is I am going to juxtapose on the left in the next few slides uh, charts mostly taken from my work with Kaminsky uh, in 99. And on the right, I am going to focus on a recent rendering or comparison to these, what I call here the systemic 11, which are 11 advanced economies that had severe uh, crises in 2007, 2009. And so let's start with currency overvaluation. Uh, the work of Rudy Dornbush stressed that overvalued currencies were a recurrent feature ahead of uh, uh, currency crashes and often ahead of default. Well, it turns out it's also a common feature ahead of banking crises. Um, it actually leads or can be associated with reduced prob profitability for firms and lead to bad loans uh, or associated with bad loans. Uh, what you see here, here low means uh, overvalued, uh, is that pre-crisis there tends to be an overvaluation and then that is subsequently corrected. Of note here is the little bitty uh, scale here. This is uh, for the periphery Europe countries showing that the overvaluation 10 years after the crisis still hasn't been only marginally reversed because it's being done through deflation rather than uh, nominal exchange rates. Um, stock prices, asset prices. Now, at this day and age, we say, well, you know, we know that asset price booms were integral uh, part of the, uh, uh, of the uh, pre-crisis uh, story, but 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it tended to be more of a narrative than sort of systemat more systematic empirical evidence. Uh, so on the left panel, I have the uh, kaminsky reinhardt focus on stock prices. And as Ken uh, uh, discussed, on the right, uh, we were uh, the first to integrate uh, the cycle in the housing market um, as, a, as an antecedent. The, the pre-crisis uh, asset boom as an antecedent of crises. Domestic credit, uh, Alan talked about this <coughs> issue. This is uh, here from Kaminsky Reinhardt. You have a domestic credit boom. The uh, credit boom is a part of the story uh, behind the uh, asset price boom the, uh, and also the, the economic activity. I think what is notable, this is for the systemic 11, is that the actual boom period was much longer uh, and the actual uh, subsequent bust is also uh, proving to be uh, longer than the uh, uh, historic uh, pattern. Now, no discussion uh, is complete without talking about financial fragility and runs. Um, the, uh, let me say a couple of remarks on this. Uh, the entire banking picture is not obviously the liability side. I think deteriorating assets uh, and concerns about uh, uh, reduced asset quality is also uh, an important feature, but runs are an integral part uh, of the uh, crisis experience. And the one thing that I would like to highlight is that it's not just runs on banks. This is run more broadly. This is runs on currency. This is runs on commercial paper, repo market, sovereign debt markets. And as we saw in Argentina only a couple of weeks ago, it was a run on central bank debt. Um, and the currency, of course. So, uh, the this is, uh, and this is, a, 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 when I talk about fragility, what sets the stage for fragility, this is very much, uh, Doug Diamond talked about this this morning, the issue of the skewing of domestic debt, of, of uh, debt towards the short end of the maturity spectrum. And this is taken from Reinhardt and Rogoff, 2011. Uh, what you typically see is a buildup in uh, short-term debt or skewing towards short maturities 
uh, and and uh, this is um, this is a fairly uh, generalized phenomenon. Another generalized phenomenon uh, is that in many cases, some of the guarantees are just not credible. Namely, uh, in the case of Greece, for example, here today in 2018. Bank deposits are at a lower level than they were at the end of 2004. Part of the story is that the uh, sense that uh, Greece may pull out of the Eurozone uh, led to repeated bank runs. This is an, and a decline in bank deposits. This is something, lack of credibility is a big issue also when the central bank cannot really be an effective lender of last resort because people don't want to hold the domestic currency. They want to hold uh, dollars or some other foreign currency that the banks cannot provide. Uh, the issue of the backing of banking liabilities. So what is the capacity of the central bank to credibly back uh, it's the liabilities of the banking sector. One of the recurring features is that the backing uh, ability deteriorates. Uh, hidden debts, which Ken has talked about, are a recurring feature, uh, and often uh, the, what are ex ante private debts become public debt afterwards. And of course, there are all kinds of nasty surprises uh, that are revealed during the crisis, which can also spark uh, runs. Um, I don't have time to go into it, but let me say that at the global dimension, in terms of international transmission, many of the same mechanisms are at work. A creditor that has is affected in one market will pull out of other markets. Lastly, on my topic of the aftermath uh, of financial crises, let me highlight again the what's already been said. These uh, post-crisis uh, recessions are uh, longer uh, and more protracted. I'm going to just highlight three elements here. One is the destruction of wealth. These, these are very large declines in housing prices. This has been updated through the most recent BIS data. Italy is still going through its 10th year of a decline in housing. Uh, the biblical seven years uh, unwinding, uh, the leverage buildup, uh, this is taken from my work with uh, Reinhardt for Jackson Hole. The unwinding is also about seven years. It's a protracted process and a headwind. Guillermo Calvo's sudden stop, adjusting big current account deficits are also a problem. They also usually adjusted via uh, recession and contracting imports. Uh, so where are we a decade later? Well, all I can say is the adjustment is not yet complete. Italy and Greece are nowhere near their pre-crisis peak in per capita income. Uh, and uh, I would note that these are also countries that had the least fiscal space before the crisis. According to the IMF, they won't have reduced the gap to the pre-crisis income, not even out in 2023. Overall, the duration of this crisis has been worse than the norm, uh, than the historic norm. So the, the, the decline has been somewhat smaller, but the duration has been longer. Finally, in this uplifting chart, uh, I show that, uh, again, as uh, Ken Rogoff talked about, a legacy of the systemic crisis has been a very high level and buildup of public sector debt. So it is plausible to ask the question, is it over? Uh, are the debt crises, have we seen the worst in 2010 with the IMF programs in Greece, uh, Portugal, uh, um, Ireland, Iceland, and so on? Um, well, from what, and this picks up on uh, some of the themes that uh, Ken Rogoff talked about, one of the takeaways from our history of sovereign credit events is that advanced economies are no strangers to sovereign default. In effect, world powers are no strangers to, southern, to, to sovereign default. Uh, inflation and financial repression have also played a role historically in reducing high bur debt burdens. 
And um, what is to say? I mean, I am sure many of you will say, no, this time is different. You know, we'll, we'll, it'll all unhappily. Uh, but not being a happily disposed person, uh, I would say that, you know, uh, so, some may have said the same uh, more than a decade ago if, if, if they were told that the advanced economies would have had a systemic uh, crisis akin to what we saw. And I will end there on that uplifting note.